John, lovely to be speaking with you. It's great to be here. You're working on, on projects around multicultural access in the Hunter region of New South Wales. What are your observations about the vulnerabilities and the needs of older people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds? Where are they vulnerable, do you think? In a, in a, in a broad spectrum of ways, particularly when you think about elderly in our cold communities, many of them came in the, in the late 60s and early 70s with um, very little, perhaps, formal education. I said that they had to learn uh, the language to an extent when they can be, the way they can be functional mm -hmm. in everyday life. But, uh, you know, as you know, over the, over the time, this, our systems are very complex. You know, look at any systems including ageing and disability, you know, the, the multiple facets and agencies involved in any kind of support system. So um, to, to navigate all those, you know, even sometimes with English being the first language, can get a bit tricky and difficult. So you can imagine how, how much harder it can be for someone uh, who English is a second language mm. or have taken up that language in a later stage of life. And uh, with ageing, with, with, with declining health and uh, with everything that comes with uh, getting older, it gets more and more complex. Mm. So in terms of uh, vulnerability, you know, this, this language issues, uh, systems navigating, you know, the, the barriers much, are much more than you'd assume for, for a regular member of the community. And harder um, for those people than perhaps navigating systems might have been for them 20 years earlier That's when right. they were younger? Yes. And w w what, what, I mean, people talk about losing language as you get older. People talk about not having a model for ageing mm. uh, because you're the first person of your heritage that you know in this country to get mm. older. And so mm. this is you're not getting older like your parents did it's a, it's a different place mm. to what extent does that complicate um, things well it's, it, it, it complicates in many different ways especially with the cold communities because many of the cold communities retain the cultural norm which was to live in a big family in a, in a joint family unlike perhaps the mainstream culture when you were 18 you, you grow up you move away so uh, to, to retain that culture and then kids grow up in this country and then they move away. They, uh, they have adopted the mainstream uh, culture, therefore they have picked up those norms. But it's not the same uh, for the elderly parents um, from cold communities. And so um, I guess the call to action on uh, dealing with elder abuse and sort of naming it as a phenomenon, as a, as a significant risk, and calling it abuse, um, began to coalesce around the ALRC report, the Law Reform Commission report. What was your response in the Hunter to that? So um, the, the, the report, uh, I, I saw the report in June 2017 over an email, and I went through the report extensively. And, um, and uh, we had to do something, because, you know, part of multicultural access pro project offices work is, is around, you know, responding to the needs of the cold communities, aging population and people with disabilities. So we had to do something. So I, I spoke to Terry Lelos, who was the state multicultural access project officer from ACC New South Wales, and, uh, and she was very much on board. She said, we have to do something, so let's, let's uh, act on it. So we spoke to uh, the ECC in Newcastle, and we approach Elder Abuse Helpline and Resource Unit of New South Wales. Uh, uh, we spoke to senior rights and, and we gathered together and uh, we, we called it a working group just to look at because the difficulty was you couldn't simply take uh, the, the Elder Abuse information to the communities. Mm -hmm. It would have to be responsive to the needs of the cold communities. And so your, your priority was, how do we get these diverse 
groups of people from the Tongan community and the Mandarin speaking, Cantonese speaking people, Filipino, Spanish, Vietnamese, Samoan communities. And how do we somehow magic bullet the information that they need to know That's right. about yeah. their rights and the yeah. services that are available? That's right. And a, yeah. and, and a poster on the wall is probably not going to do it. Yeah. So what did you need to do in order to get that information yes. to them? Well, first, we, we needed to look at, we, we needed to have information uh, perhaps uh, adopted, you know, and we did. We, we, uh, we, we put it forward in a way that didn't focus so much on the terms of elderly and abuse, but the rights of the, of the senior citizens, rights of the uh, older people. And what does it mean to, to, be, uh, to have positive ageing? Uh, rather than focusing on abuse. Mm. The idea was to engage the communities around positive ageing and when sometimes unfortunately when the rights are not respected that's when the elder abuse occurs. And, and some of it, you'd know that some of it is pretty straightforward black and white where there's a bra breaking of the law. So you can have interventionist systems in place it's a law to intervene, justice system to intervene, police to intervene. But Elder Abuse Helpline and Resource Unit, they released their report um, up to 2016, and 39% of the elder abuse is psychological abuse. Now, what are the laws around that uh, to put in an uh, interventionist approach uh, when someone is being psychologically abused? So. It's an issue that everybody, it is, it is everyone's issue, uh, you know, uh, in, in 20 years time it will catch up with me. So, so uh, we have to act now. Uh, Professor uh, Morgan yesterday morning, she was talking about that um, what we are looking at is sociocultural change. Um, and and, and f for any sociocultural change, uh, it, it takes a longer period of time. And, uh, and, and uh, one of the most important aspect of uh, driving sociocultural change is, is conversations. Mm -hmm. And how, uh, you know, how do you engage communities in, in that sort of conversation? And so how did you end up doing that? So we, we, uh, we, um, we held consultation with our presentation with specific members of the cold communities. We got their feedback, we adopted the adopted the presentation and we, we took it to uh, seven different communities, so Mandarin speaking, Cantonese speaking, Tongan, Samoan, Tagalog, Filipino, uh, Spanish, Vietnamese community. And, uh, um, and we presented them with data, mainly from New South Wales Elder Abuse Helpline and Resource Unit, that who were the perpetrators of elder abuse. And when you see that 23% of the perpetrators were sons, this is Elder Abuse uh, Helpline and Resource Unit report uh, after 2016. And 27% were sons and 23% were daughters. And 12% 12 uh, 12 were partners. So 62% of perpetrators of Elder Abuse in New South Wales, of those well, that were reported to Helpline and Resource Unit, were close family members. Um, so, uh, you know, much of it is happening uh, perhaps behind closed door, and for external systems to intervene, uh, it, it's much more uh, tricky. So, so everybody in the community needs to be engaged in the issue. Uh, it has to be everybody's business. And what sorts of conversations did it spark when you present people with that kind of stark data? You know, initially um, in the con community conversations, there was reluctance to admit. So when we presented them with data, they were like, is this uh, with the mainstream cultures? This isn't us. Yes. This is not us. This is some other That's community. That's right. Yes, yeah. yes. Every single community conversation response was, is this with uh, some other communities? Is this with uh, the mainstream culture? Uh, and and, and I, I, I had to tell them that, you know, 15% of the reported calls at New South Wales Elder Abuse Helpline Resource Unit were uh, from the call communities. And in 2016, 26% of New South Wales population was call background. 
nominally speaking. So when you match those data, when we, pro when we project those data, 15% is pretty high, mm. you know, especially when you, when you realize that there's not even, uh, you know, this reluctance to acknowledge that mm. elder abuse uh, exists. And once you get beyond that notion of, oh no, that's not happening in my community, yes. that's happening in some other dysfunctional community that I'm not part of. That's right. <laughs> See, the, but the great thing was everyone was uh, engaged. Uh, sometimes you couldn't move beyond the fifth slide, uh, which is past the data. Uh, the first data is around who were the perpetrators, and the second data was what percentage of the elder abuse were psychological abuse or uh, financial abuse or physical abuse or sexual abuse. Um, the, it, it, every single person in the room were engaged, even those who were cross-armed. Uh, in, in a, it made them thick. And all community conversations ended up with positive response. And what, uh, what sort of response? Uh, what can we do? Uh, what every single one of them? What can we do? Uh, and, and in our presentation, this, uh, this well, this 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 is a slide that says, talk about it. You know, the least you can do is talk about it. If you see something, say something. Uh, uh, ask ask the questions. And who are you presenting this to? Is it, are you presenting it to older people in core communities? Yes. Or you are? Yes, yes, over 65s. Over 65s. Yes. These were groups uh, run by Northern Settlement Services, social, ser social uh, support groups, yes. Mm. So most and of them. Any and there were a couple of family members and carers present, yes. And any feedback subsequent to, the pres to these presentations being rolled out? The, there's a report coming out. Um, so the, the last... So we, we effectively uh, ran a campaign from 8th May 2017 um, until uh, 6th of February. The, the campaign was launched by Honourable Minister Tanya Davies um, in Newcastle. We held those conversations. We also held um, a, a training for bilingual uh, workers, educators managers of the core providers as uh, as well as CEO from ethnic uh, hunter multicultural communities ethnic community leaders uh, this was a train the trainer training for the bilingual workers and aid care coordinators and the ethnic community leaders to take this conversation to their communities mm -hmm. as and when needed so that, that we we have got a report and uh, it's due to be released so watch out the space. Mm. And do you think that this is a worthwhile first step? Essentially, consciousness raising and, and, and sort of breaking that taboo around just starting the conversation? Oh, I, I, I think so. Especially, uh, you know, listening to Professor Morgan, who said yesterday, you know, any, cultural, any kind of sociocultural change takes about 20 to 30 years. So... The, the conversation needs to happen now with everyone. So while the reforms in systems, uh, you know, laws around HK, uh, you know, all, all those system changes take place and they take place uh, over a long period of time, the conversations need to start right now with the communities. Um, so it's, uh, it's one thing to... Uh, you know, share information and share a conversation with people with similar views. It's another uh, to to have a conversation who may not necessarily share the same views as yourselves. And often with with cold communities where there is a reluctance to accept that the elder abuse exists, to facilitate that sort of conversation uh, is very crucial for that long term goal. Mm. A gentle way to have a hard conversation, hey? Yes, yes. <laughs> Lovely to chat with you, John. Oh, thank you very much.